it's time to talk in more detail about ignitions. And, and there's always, I've said before, a motivation for why I'm doing these videos. I've thought about doing some more detailed type stuff with the ignition and never really had the motivation to do it. But I was watching the other day somebody who had posted some videos. They were going to do a cross-country trip from California to Florida. Uh, they had what? Some kind of an early to mid-60s bug. I was thinking, you know, they're going to get stuck at some point. And sure enough, they did. And I, a couple of different reasons why they got stuck. But one of the primary reasons they got stuck was the points that they had inside their distributor. And I'm like, that's one of the first things I would have done. You know, you just get one of these things. You've purchased it from somebody and it's a mismatched pile of stuff. And you look on the side and it's got a condenser. So you know it's got points. And you're thinking about things that you're going to do and modify and upgrade. And it's like, no. The first thing you do is not like dual carbs. The first thing you do is you get rid of the points. No points. So... You just flat out don't. And I know there are people that are going to tell you, well, points never leave you stranded. Well, you tell that to those people in that car who got stuck out in New Mexico or Texas or wherever it was. And they're out there trying to diagnose some electrical problem in 30 degree weather one day and 17 degree weather like the next. And it ends up being a mechanical issue with their freaking points. A mechanical issue that wouldn't have existed because the replacement stuff doesn't have mechanical problems. Now, that doesn't mean that these things don't fail. I mean, I've got uh, the electronics are in here. doesn't mean they don't fail, but it's probably not going to fail because it's made it through the first, I don't know, I've got 500 plus miles on this particular unit right here. Just kind of once they get to a certain point, you're pretty sure that they're not going to fail. But we're going to take a look now at a whole bunch of the components and kind of talk about them in order. Now, ultimately, we need to end with the device. First component up is going to be the coil. So uh, I believe that this particular type of coil is receiving good reviews these days. Not horribly expensive, good stock replacement. I think it actually even has a little bit more potential voltage than stock. And I think what people like about it is the following Germany right there. So it's not Chinese, but let's talk about what a coil actually does and perhaps some misconceptions. S.G. Kent, he is correct. Adding a bigger and meaner coil will do nothing more for you than a stock coil. You only need a higher output coil if you're running a wide gap. True enough, and maybe some high compression, and that's a maybe high compression. Uh, for my channel, you probably aren't doing this because you're not running the kind of camshafts that uh, would benefit from that kind of com compression. Let's see, what else have we got here? Let's see, we left out flame kernel and ionization. So I'm going to talk about both of those. Let's jump over to the ionization first, because that is the purpose of the coil, is to ionize the air-fuel mixture between the spark plug leads, you know, right there at the gap. Wikipedia, plasma physics. Okay, there's one property that we need right here. Let's drop down. Electrical conductivity is what we're looking for. Electrical conductivity is very high. For many purposes, the conductivity of a plasma may be treated as infinite. That's the equivalent of saying it has no resistance. Uh, I've looked up the actual resistance. It's on the order of a very high-quality piece of copper. Anyway, plasmas have very little resistance. This is important. Flame kernel. I'm going to show you guys a little picture later on. It's not applicable right now. But yes, flame kernel is important. Let's do a little bit more about coils specifically. All right, a lot of people want to run the Pertronics. So I get myself an igniter, an igniter 2, or an igniter 3, and I go out and I pick up an, you know, a compatible Pertronics coil. Uh, this happens to be a 4611 flamethrower, 40,000 volt, terrific. Three ohms, make sure you're getting the three ohms or what is applicable to what it is that you purchased. I'm running just a plain old igniter, just a plain old CompuFire. Therefore, if I was going with a Petronix, I would go with either this one or this other one. They're off by a price of $10. What's important about this is that this one is an epoxy. If you can see it right there somewhere. I can't quite get it to work. There it is, epoxy. Yay. All right, the other one is oil filled. So let's jump over to Pertronics's own frequently asked questions page, and I'm going to show you why I would do the epoxy and only the epoxy and avoid their oil filled stuff. 
All right, Petronix, ignition products. So I'm over here on their FAQ page. Frequently asked questions. This is how I mount the flamethrower coil sideways or even upside down. Okay, oil-filled coils should always, I it's a little bit of a grammatical error there, always mounted upright to prevent potential leak of critical fluid as the coil heats up and cools down. I'm sorry, but I want to be able to mount my coil how I want to be able to mount my coil, and this is why I would not do one of their fluid-filled coils. And I know there's somebody out there who's down there in Alabama, his name's Mike, and I know he had problems with a leaking coil. So, there you go. Get the epoxy ones. But it's only going to do you some good if, let's go back to the SAMA, and we re-quote S.G. Kent, who says, if you're running a wide gap. So, there you go. We've got out the gap. And, uh, geez, other than that, I think coils are about done. Okay, next on the list of items, as the electricity flows through and attempts to reach the spark plug, it has to go down the wires, out of the coil, specifically the coil wire. And generally speaking, our wires are going to be of two different types. You've got the solid core, which is the old fastened uh, non-resistors. And then you've got the newer stuff, which is the carbon core. Uh, my car's got carbon core. There's another type of wire. It is more high-end, and I don't think too many of us are going to do it because, believe it or not, the carbon core doesn't actually have a whole bunch of resistance. You're running a Petronics. You're running one of those other little units. Uh, I would suggest that we defer to what Petronics says. Here's what Petronics has to say. We jump over there to their FAQ question page. Very important to verify that your spark plug wires are compatible with the ignition system. With all Petronics ignitions, we recommend that a suppression style spark plug wire, carbon core, be used. So this is what they're telling you. And I would not go against their recommendation. So if you go over to the SAM and you start reading about the wires and the plugs and whatnot, you're going to encounter stuff like the following. Three years of happy driving, using standard issue plugs, wires, and everything else. So I would not trust this. Uh, you can get onto here and you can say everything. And for all you know, this guy didn't actually inventory everything that he's got. And he doesn't actually have standard issue everything. Maybe he's actually running, you know, resistance wires and he just thinks that they're standard issues. So don't trust it. Go out do your own inventory like I'm about ready to do. For I think that's about it for plug wires. Moving on, we get to the cap and the rotor. So let's take a look at the rotor here real, real quick. There's already a re uh, resistor in the rotor. That depends. Some rotors have them, some rotors don't. Not everybody understands that, but yes, I have one of each. Let us take a look now at the cap and rotor. So here's a nice Bosch cap and rotor pair, and you're going to be like, oh, I want that copper stuff down in here. And I want this. Uh, it doesn't really matter that much whether these are aluminum or copper. Over the distances that these things are going to force the electricity to run, the difference in resistance between aluminum and and the copper alloys won't be enough to make a hill of beans difference. So it doesn't matter. Either one works. Both are fine. And you can do whatever you want here. If you go over to Petronics, I'm not going to bring them up, but Petronics has no requirements on the rotor being either resistor or non-resistor. I can't find anything on it. I've been looking around. Nothing. So it doesn't matter. If, like me, you have a non-resistor one, go ahead and use it. And that does rotors and caps. All right, next on the list is going to be the spark plugs. And let's start off with a little bit of a story. Okay, I have in my hand here some Bosch Super Plus. And I will allow you to look at that number. 7902, you can do your research on that. But if you do, you'll realize that this is the correct plug for a 73 Super Beetle, which this happens to be. I'm here to tell you though that this 7902 is incorrect for this motor for a couple of reasons having nothing to do with the ignition. So basically Protronics has no requirements on your spark plugs. So you can use resistor or non-resistor plugs which are one of the variables that you can get with plugs. But these are incorrect for this vehicle because this thing does not have 1973 heads on it. They are dual port, but they are aftermarket. Uh, and watch my videos, you'll be like, oh, geez, you're running Mafoco heads. That's right, I've got Mafoco 041s on here. And they use a Type 4 spark plug, which means it has a 3 quarter inch reach. These plugs are half inch reach. However, these will bolt into this particular head. The half inch reach, however, will put the prong and uh, the electrodes, which you can see right there, a quarter inch down inside the metal 
body of the head. And that's, uh, although it's going to start and run, it's going to run pretty piss poor. So we don't want to do that. Uh, there's not really any other reason than that, other than the fact that the thing would run piss poor if you plugged them in there. But other than that, it would probably work. You have to know what it is that's in there. You have to take ownership of this particular engine. And, you know, most of you probably picked up something that came from somebody else. Now, take ownership of what you've got. Inventory what you've got. So, I'm going to go ahead and inventory all my pieces later on in the vid. But that's good for the story right now. And let's go take a deeper look at plugs. As I just mentioned, there are resistor and non-resistor plugs. As is shown here in this particular video, if you don't like a resistor plug, you can always take the resistor out. And there's a few videos on uh, YouTube that show you how to do it. This one's pretty decent. I was reading a technical paper, obviously not V8, not VW, but a technical papers, you know, some information that was produced by PhDs. And they came up with two things that have the potential to improve the performance of a spark plug. Two things. The first one you can see right here. Do you see how the tip doesn't extend out very far from the face of the threads? Like if you go down the threads, let me see if I can bring this up. Let me see if I can zoom in. Ooh, it moves. Anyway, do you see this face right across here? Do you see how none of this stuff projects very far past the face? This is a regular old plug. This particular plug, the W8CC, is what Mafoco recommends for my head. A more modern approach to this, as you can see, is a projected center electrode. So this electrode on the Bosch, this is an upgrade, a mild upgrade for the W8CC. If you look at Bosch, they will tell you that this thing sticks two millimeters out into the combustion chamber. It is supposed to give you ever so slightly better performance. There you go. A potential change that can offer you a benefit. Uh, continuing to look at this particular thing, do you see the center electrode? Let me see if I can... All right, the center electrode, which is right there, that little piece of ceramic right through in here. All right, when you get a spark plug, that center electrode is defined with a particular heat range. So when you get a plug and it says it's a hot plug or it says it's a cold plug, that doesn't mean that your head is, will be hot or cold. Like somehow or another, the spark plug can make your head cold, or the spark plug can make your head hot. That's not really how it works. That heat range is telling you how hot or cold this center piece of ceramic is supposed to be. And this, uh, the technical paper that I read said that you should run a hotter, not a colder plug. Again, they, they didn't say that the benefits were huge, but they said that it helped a tiny bit. So what you're looking at is a plug with an extended electrode, projected electrode, I think most of the time they're referred to as projected, and then two, you want one that's a little bit hotter. Again, you'd have to experiment a little tiny bit. Back to that old adage that I started this thing with, is take ownership of your vehicle. You might have to do some experimenting with what you've got to figure out what works best for your car. I think that my particular engine down there, which runs fairly cool, can use a little bit hotter plug and I'm not running a projected plug so I could go a little bit hotter and projected and I might be able to get a little bit more performance. The last component is up. Doesn't mean the video is going to end, we're just on to the last component. So what do we what do we think about these things? Alright, talking about Petronics here, not the clones, just the Petronics. Okay, this guy right here, I've got a certain amount of respect for him. He's a pretty bright guy. So what does he say? Right over here. The Protronics is just a points replacement. Opening up the gaps is most likely to just cause misfiring. The important part of what he says there, Protronics, is just a points replacement. It's another guy. Different thread. Right there. If all you did was install a points replacement, there is no gain in performance and no need to increase the plug gap. In other words, he's saying that a Protronics or a CompuFire is simply a points replacement. I'm now going to attempt to convince you that those things are in fact not a points replacement. The Petronics units are a compact, high-performance electronic ignition that simply sits in the position of where the points used to be. We're going to have to go in some weird directions to do this. 
hopefully you'll be entertained and you'll learn a few things. Well, in order to show you that these devices are not just points replacement, you need to go and venture into the realm of a scope. Uh, I guess in the old days they would have referred to this thing as an oscilloscope, but now everything's attached to a computer, so they're not oscilloscopes, they're just plain scopes. And you take it and you plot it on the computer, and you take screenshots looking kind of like that thing right there. And they call these things waveforms. Uh, these two waveforms that you're looking at here, a blue and a red, are waveforms from the primary circuit. In other words, this is what happens to the circuit that generates the power. So you have in blue voltage and you have in red current. And what we need to look at is this section right through here. See this red right here? The red is the current. This happens to be the voltage down there. So it's just a straight line. And this happens to be kind of a straightish line. This one goes kind of horizontally across, and this guy's kind of heading up. But what's happening during this particular point in time is the coil is charging. So right at this point right here, the points close, and we start charging the coil. So why did the amper, you know, why does the amperage just not immediately jump up? I mean, it's only a three ohm resistance coil, right? Well, the amperage doesn't go up because you have to have the big, you know, you, you've got your sensors placed across the terminals. Some of the energy is being absorbed, and since the energy is being absorbed, you don't really get the amperage flowing out the other side until the canister, the coil, has charged itself. So it just goes up, 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 until, well, okay, we're charged. Then, mechanically, the points fire and blango, you get a whole bunch of noise and stuff like this, and then the, the thing repeats. So that's your primary circuit. Basically, from here to here, this is your dwell. So you go from there into here, you charge, and then the secondary takes over, and the primary, that's what this kind of stuff, this bouncy little stuff here, it's kind of reacting to what's happening on the secondary circuit. So keep in mind what's happening with the dwell portions of these graphs right there, and now we'll take a look at the protronics. It took me forever to find one of these waveforms for an igniter, but uh, I did, and here's proof. Um, this vehicle does have electronic ignition and it does have an igniter. So let's take a look at the waveforms that are in the video. Well, this is the best I could do from that particular video. Uh, it's just a little of a, it's like a screenshot from uh, somewhere earlier in that particular video. Sadly, it's a bit on the clustered side, but it does contain the two pieces that we're looking for, which is the red, which is the amperage, and the blue, which is the voltage. And these are the primary circuits. So, what's the difference? Well, we've got a loading of the coil again. It's referred to as the dwell. Our dwell starts right here, and it goes until right there. So the dwell starts. We load the coil, and then this is where it gets different. We go into something called current limiting mode. So it's like a bucket. You fill the bucket up, but it's got a small hole in it. So if you don't keep some current going through it, it's going to lose some energy. So you pass a little bit of energy through it just to maintain it. You can see that down here in the voltage. We're applying a voltage, applying a voltage. And then it's like, well, okay, we've got enough in the bucket. Let's cut back the voltage. And the, you know, the voltage is cut back significantly required to maintain this right here. What is the benefit of doing this right here? Well, during this particular point right there, if you continue to dump energy into the system, the energy is not being absorbed. So what happens to it? You know, the power of a system in you know, electric terms is voltage times current. So I've got a voltage, which is down here. It's kind of high. And then I've got current. Remember now, the current on the old system kept going up. So I've got a bigger voltage, and I'm going to have a bigger current. That power is going nowhere. It's just dissipating as heat. So when you take a coil and you turn it on and you've got a long dwell period, which is what's going to happen with a stock points system. When the engine is running really slow, you get a really long dwell. When the engine runs fast, you get a short dwell. When you got a system like this, you get kind of like a fixed dwell. It knows how much time it takes to charge the coil and it dedicates only that much time that it takes to building up that energy and then it tries to conserve. 
It keeps the coil from getting hot. So the hot coil, what happens? Well, the coil gets hot. The wires inside get hot. If the wires inside get hot, they don't transfer electricity properly. They don't transfer the electricity properly. You don't build up charge, and at some point you get misfire. Therefore, the Petronix is not a stock replacement. It is a mild performance upgrade. Let me take a few minutes here to talk about why I think the cheap clones malfunction and what you might be able to do to get them to work. Let's give it a go. This is the secondary waveform from that inline six. Uh, all six cylinders. These spikes represent, I hope you can see them. I can see them on my screen. But these spikes represent the peak voltage required to essentially fire off the spark. So I'm going to draw a little line across them. Okay, we don't have exactly the same voltage, yet that shouldn't be the case. They should all be gapped to the same amount. They're all running basically the same motor. Why are they different? Well, you might get some kind of a variation because the spark plug is getting a little bit worn out. Maybe this one right here. Throw it a little bit. The gap opens up. When the gap opens up, it takes a little bit more voltage to fire off the plug. So you can get some variability. Down here is 7,500 volts. Up here, it's a little over 10,000. So if you go from that to that, that's an increase of about one. Like a right, one third. It's like one third more. How do we know that this could possibly do it? Well, this particular motor uses a gap of 0.32 from the factory. So I imagine that I've looked at the picture in the, in the video. It looks like a factory setup. So that's 0.32. So 0.32 produces voltages that look something like this. My 73 is spec at 0.24. I don't know if I can write this. Spec at 0.24. Sorry, it's 0.024. A fuel injected bug is spec at 0.028. Those numbers are both less than the 0.032 that this particular motor requires. So we should have voltages that are down below that 10,000 volts. Well, that's not terrible. So what does this have to do with the little devices which sit on the primary current, uh, primary circuit? Well, these voltages that are happening in the secondary circuit they induce into the primary circuit a corresponding kind of mirror imagey looking type thing. So if you've got a variability of this type over here, you're going to get a variability of that type on the primaries. And if you open up your gap like this in a performance fashion and you don't run these guys, like don't run that, like don't run that. Uh, in my car, I'm going to let you know a little hint. I'm going to look at it later, but I run an 035 at present. If you open up your gap, it takes more voltage. The secondary induces into the primary a nice kick, and the primary somehow or another is able to overload those little devices that are kind of wimply and piss poorly built, so they burn out on you. You want to get one to work? Stick with stock. You stick with this 024 or something like that, and don't do this. That is, however, not a performance way of doing it. So you're going to do this. You do it for enhancement of your system. So if you want to be able to run a bigger gap, it's the cheap ones. All right, next step in the process, we need to talk about something that I refer to as like the, the electric elephant in the room, all right? Mechanics like to refer to something called a hot spark. Well, it turns out that there isn't really anything called a hot spark. What you have is a fantastic light show, but did you really make the spark, the spark hotter? Or did you just make a big light show? So let's get going on this piece. All right, so you've got a stock coil, or you got a blue coil, where you take something like a capacitive discharge ignition system, and you fire it back through one of the other coils, and you can build like 30,000 volts, or 40,000 volts, or 120,000 volts. It doesn't really matter. Because if you don't change that gap, the only thing you get voltage-wise is the voltage that it takes to fire the gap. So if you don't believe me, it says it right here. This uh, particular little paragraph was put together by a manufacturer of one of those scoping systems. So, so let me read to you. A 300 volt primary voltage, therefore, will be 30,000 volt in the secondary winding. Sounds like a stock coil. The voltage will only build until the breakdown voltage of the spark gap is reached. Terminology, breakdown voltage. The firing voltage of the spark plug. Notice that they didn't say anything about how hot your coil was or how hot your CDI was, or how brilliant the light show is. 
effectively, if you don't increase that gap, you don't have a hotter spark. All right, at some point, somebody's going to tell you that you need that light show, that that light show is important in some way for burning the fuel. So, you know, I've been showing you some of these graphs, and the guys, the technicians that work with these graphs, they literally refer to that sparking duration as the burn line. You can see it right here in the graphs. And a whole bunch of them literally think that this is what burns the fuel. And uh, let me give you a sound bite here. I feel bad for this guy. His presentation generally on his video was pretty solid, but he's just absolutely spewing a pile of nonsense here. Let's, uh, let's throw it up and give it a listen. And there has to be enough energy left over in the coil to maintain an adequate burn time to consume or chemically convert all the oxygen and fuel constituents within that combustion chamber. All right, that's complete and utter nonsense. Uh, the burn right here, it's a plasma. A plasma does not burn. It's a bunch of ions. In order to burn something, you operate at temperatures for ordinary matter. Not ion matter, but ordinary matter temperatures. And ordinary matter temperatures are below plasma temperatures. So why don't we take a look a little bit at plasma now. So we're interested in the temperature of a plasma. So it kind of makes sense that you might want to go to somebody who's really technically competent in doing this stuff. So let's hit up a bunch of PhD type people. And here's what we're looking for. Plasma vibrational temperature, spark discharge, isooctane. I hate it when people say isooctane. Air, homogeneous mixture. Anyway, this is a gasoline engine. These are the temperatures that they picked up on. This is between six and 7,000 Kelvins. Okay, in case you don't know, in Kelvin, the hottest part of your flame operates down here in around the 2,000 Kelvin. That's the hottest it's going to get. It's around 2,000, and then it flashes over and it cools off from there. So, plasmas are up here. Ordinary matter is down here at its hottest. Uh, that's a factor of three or more, so the plasma is an awful lot hotter than the ordinary matter. Now, what's cool about this is most sparks don't last any more than about two milliseconds. So if you go from minus 15 to right around here, that gap is about 6 degrees of rotation. Uh, you think about that. That guy told us that it's going to consume all the fuel. So it's going to consume all the fuel in 6 degrees of rotation. Uh, no, that doesn't happen. You can see this gigantic spike right here. It's probably even off the graph. This is 400 milliamps, but the spontaneous peak that you get right there, the amount of current that blasts through, yeah, pretty high. And then it immediately falls off, and it's kind of limited by the resistance of the circuit. All right, given that they had a, an optical fiber running down into their chamber, they were able to take pictures. And this is what's really cool. Look at this, zero microseconds. In case you don't know what a microsecond is, a microsecond is a millionth of a second. So if you go out to this right here, this is 100 microseconds. This is 0.1 milliseconds. All this stuff is happening within the first half millisecond. Let's just take a look here real quick. First of all, right at the point of plasma formation, bang, you get an enormous blast of energy into the system. This is what I'm telling you. You want that gigantic blast of energy right there. Next, take a look at, generally speaking, what's going on here. The light is slowly, slowly going out because this blast, being a plasma, is hotter than the combustion chamber is going to be. So it's going to start losing temperature immediately. Now, even though you're passing electricity through it and there is resistance and there's going to be some additional heat added to it, that heat added is in the order of like ordinary matter temperatures when we're talking plasma temperatures. Let's look at the other piece. Do you see this halo that's running around the outside? You can see that there's a halo right here, just 50 microseconds past the initial blast, you can see that halo. Well, that halo is the actual burning. It's not the spark. It's the burning of the air fuel inside the combustion chamber. And notice, bigger, 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 bigger. It just starts moving out. What's behind the burned fuel, of course, is burned fuel. Out here in the dark area is unburned fuel. That's why the flame expands out. It's expanding from where it has burned into an area where it has not burned. So what's behind, clearly, since it's already burned, does not burn. Therefore, the spark can't possibly be burning anything. It's already been burned. 
Anyway, I think that's enough for the paper. Oh, it's good to find some backup information uh, in the form of experimentation. So I dug around, and there's this guy named Richard Holdener who does mostly V8 stuff. He's passed through my feed a few times, and I've poked at it and not really watched his stuff. It's just, it's V8. But he ended up doing some experimentation with spark plugs, and he came up with this particular set of curves right here. Uh, it's pretty interesting what he did. title of the thing is up there just in case you want to check it out. But he went from 0.01 plug gap, 0.020 plug gap, all the way up to 0.1 plug gap, which is really big. But anyway, you can see all the way across from the low RPM side to the high RPM side that the bigger gap right here, the 0.1, produced a little bit more torque across the board. The bigger cap did produce a little bit more power. It's not a massive gain. If you look at what he's got, it's between 1% and 2%. But I'll take 1% or 2% if all I have to do is open my gap a little bit. All right, final components are the actual units themselves. So here's an electronic module that I actually purchased. This is one of the ones that I blew up. This is the first one that I did. And uh, as I said, I believe that what causes these things to blow up is the spark plug gap. So 024 max on that one. I also blew up one of these. It's an MP. Blew it up, probably the same problem, spark plug gap. Uh, I have an ancient one of these that is heading towards 40 years old. Not quite. I've also got a spare one of these that's like eight years old now. Uh, what I currently run in the car is this guy right there. It is working fantastic. And I would recommend this over this because the triggers are more accurate and it's actually a little tiny bit easier to install these than it is the other one. Now, what kind of spark plug gap do you run? I'd already mentioned in the video that I run 0.035. If my stock gap was 024, how do I get to 035? Well, in 1975, they went to fuel injected bugs. This is the back end of a fuel injected bug. It happens to be a 1975 Legrand. In addition to the fuel injection, if you look down in under here, you're going to see this big bubble right here on the back apron. And under that bubble is a great big old muffler. Turns out that that thing's not actually a muffler all specifically on its own. It's also a catalytic converter, which means that these things, in addition to being fuel injected, they were also unleaded gas vehicles. Now, they still ran with the same distributor, they same, ran with the same coil, they should have had the same gap, right? What happens when you take the lead out? Well, you don't foul your plugs is what you do because plugs generally don't carbon foul. They lead foul. It's not carbon. It was the lead. Lead is swill. It was poison. It was bad. So anyway, they got the lead out. They ran it to 0.028. Now keep that 028 number in mind. Let's go to Pertronics and see what they have to say. Right down here, what should I gap the plugs to? We recommend that the gap be increased to a maximum of 0 0.007 over the factory spec. 028 and 007 is 035, and what did I tell you early in the vid that I'm running? 035. I think 035 is conservative and that you should probably, after verifying that your motor works at 035, you push it up and try and get 040. I don't know if I go too much past that. I don't know if our coils can handle it, but I'm pretty sure the igniters and the coffee fires can but there will be performance gains. Your choice. It's your car. But um, it's difficult for me to get into my spark plugs that are on the front because in order to get there to change them from 035 and push them up to 040, I got to take off my air filters, the linkage, and the carburetors, which you know, it's not a horribly difficult thing. It's just massively time consuming. And then you have to adjust everything, which is a pain. So I've had them at 035 for years. It works. Maybe I'm giving up a little bit of performance, perhaps. So one of these days I'll have to push up the gap. Anyway, I was going to do an inventory of the stuff that I've got in my car, but this video is just way too long at this point. So I will video that and put it down, not as a technical vid, but just as an add-on to my general 1973 bot uh, list. Anyway, I apologize for making this so incredibly long. Well, it was just mind-blowing when I started getting into this, just how bad the information is. So... Uh, hopefully you learned something. If you think I'm wrong, go do your own research. But uh, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm on the right base. And, uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy with what I'm telling you right there. Yeah, anyway, thanks for watching. Let me get out of here and go do something else.